we will now spend a little over an hour in what I hope will be a very stimulating, interactive discussion among people with collectively over 100 years of experience in the world of LPG, representing a very interesting and diverse sets of what Rachel Kite called the X's and the Y's. I'm going to introduce them, make some brief opening remarks. Each panelist will then have some opening remarks of his or her own. And then we will have a group discussion on a number of topics, and then open the discussion to questions from the audience. I'm going to introduce them in a special order, not the order you see them. And this is the order of the amount of LPG cylinders in the country per capita. And I choose that because the four countries represented here are a very broad spectrum of how much has been achieved in their LPG programs and the stage at which they are addressing issues in LPG development. Let me get, begin by introducing to my immediate left Mr. Rashid Idrisi. He is the chairman of the Fédération de l'Energie du Maroc, and I thank him especially for the support of his organization in making this day possible. He is also the chairman of SOMAS, the Storage and Infrastructure uh, uh, entity for Morocco for LPG. He joined the oil and gas sector in the 1980s and has held numerous senior positions, including managing director of Afrika Gas, Techno Gas, and uh, director general of the gas division of Aqua Group. He has a he has a business administration degree from the Ecole uh, des uh, Pardon uh, des Hautes uh, Etudes Commerciales. Um, and his country has a ratio of approximately one cylinder to every citizen, among the very highest in the world. There are a few people in this country who do not have LPG cylinders. They probably can't be found. It is a remarkable story, but it represents a, an organic journey over a couple of decades with a very structured set of steps and learnings that I think will be very informative for everyone in the room and an inspiration for discussion with our other panelists. Uh, at the very far end of our panel, representing Indonesia, is Mr. R. Zulfikar, who is the project coordinator for Pertamina, the state oil company of Indonesia. And he is responsible there for all of the activities involved in the kerosene to LPG conver conversion project, which Ms. Kite referenced earlier. He joined Pertamita in 1992 and has had a, a diverse career with responsibilities uh, including uh, information technology, marketing and training, uh, and regional domestic gas man management in different parts of the country. He has degrees from the Sepulu uh, November Institute of Technology and the University of Indonesia. Indonesia's ratio is about one per four people. And Indonesia represents a story of a planned, rapid, massive LPG program starting from near zero use of LPG. To my second left is Wanjiko Manyara, who is the general manager of the Petroleum Institute of East Africa, which she joined in 1999. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Health and a Diploma in Marketing, and is a member of so many boards and committees, I can't begin to try to, to mention them. Uh, in her field and her areas of, of personal interest. She began her career uh, with ExxonMobil, uh, must be very recently. Uh, and in Kenya, the ratio of cylinders to people is not totally certain, but something like one for every 10 people. And I like to characterize Kenya in a bold and a challenging way as uh, a country of great aspiration for LPG, which is taming its past in order to take bold steps forward. Finally, the second from your right is Martin Mesumbe, who is the Director of Petroleum Products at the Ministry of Energy in, and Water in Cameroon, whose project was highlighted by Ms. Kite earlier. And he has been in that position since 2011. 
He has 20 years of experience in the downstream oil and gas sector in Cameroon and an advanced degree from Birmingham University in the UK. He is the key driver of the Cameroon LPG initiative. And Cameroon represents a country which, starting from a small beginning, is planning systematically to be very big. The ratio there, also about 1 in 10. The International Energy Agency, every few years, puts out the World Energy Outlook, which describes its view of the scenarios of how energy will be, will be used in the world. And they have looked at the role of different solutions, different kinds of energy, different kinds of fuels, under scenarios for achieving the universal access to energy goal. I, I happen to have had the privilege of being on the review committee for this year's forthcoming update to that report. So the last one suggested that if universal energy access were to be achieved, at least a billion people of the three billion mentioned in earlier remarks would need to be using LPG by 2030. I cannot tell you what they will predict in the upcoming report, only to say that that number is going to be much bigger under the new scenario for sustainable energy for all. This is a tremendous challenge to all of us in the room to achieve. My fellow panelists are, are all completed or are modifying or are taking the journeys in their countries to contribute significantly to that global target. The key to LPG being used is to have cylinders for people to use it with in the residential sector. So we will talk a bit today about the path to getting many cylinders deployed and used in a country. In many countries which have begun this journey, uh, organically, the process can take 20 or 30 years to complete, where 50%, 60%, 90% of the country is using LPG. Our colleagues in Indonesia did it in a basically four or five. India seems to be doing a size of population similar in scope to Indonesia in three. So this is very inspiring. So we will talk about what makes that possible and what are some of the challenges in being able to achieve such rapid results. And time permitting, I'd like also for us to talk a little bit about reaching the poor with LPG. LPG in every country will reach a natural commercial boundary of what portion of the population can use it on an economically sustainable basis and allow business to make adequate profits to serve them. To reach the rest of all of the population, countries try different things. And the experience in this room can speak directly to that additional element of LPG for development. With that, I would like to uh, invite our speakers, in this case, in the order of their seating, to make each a few minutes of remarks about the history of LPG in their country and the issues that they now are facing. Thank you. Mr. Idrissi, if you please. Thank you, Alex. Mesdames et messieurs, c'est pour moi un réel plaisir de prendre la parole à ce side event sous le thème de LPG for Development. Au nom de tous les membres de la Fédération marocaine de l'énergie, je remercie la World LPG Gaz. Donc je saisis cette opportunité pour vous présenter l'expérience du Maroc dans le développement du marché des GPL, ainsi que les principales orientations dans le domaine. L'intégration de l'utilisation des GPL au Maroc date de plusieurs années. Et ce, pour faire face à la déforestation massive qu'on connaît aujourd'hui en Afrique et apporter une énergie propre à toute la population. Aujourd'hui, le Royaume du Maroc a réussi à atteindre un taux de pénétration de 99%, avec une consommation s'élevant environ à 2,5 millions de tonnes par an, chiffre 2016, sachant que chaque année, nous avons une augmentation entre 3 et 5 Donc pour atteindre cet objectif, le Royaume du Maroc a mis en place une stratégie solide 
alliant le secteur public et privé. Donc, dans l'expérience marocaine, il faut les deux secteurs, le privé plus le public. Le public, c'est le secteur qui a permis de mettre, en, euh, de mettre un cadre réglementaire à travers des lois, des décrets et instaurer une subvention de la bouteille de butin. Le prix de vente de gaz en bouteille est fixé à 3 dirhams 33 le kilo, à peu près 30 centimes de, 36 centimes de dollars depuis 1990. En parallèle, le secteur privé a développé des infrastructures nécessaires. Bien sûr, pour pouvoir distribuer 2,5 millions de tonnes, il faut beaucoup d'infrastructures dans des moyens logistiques sur toute la chaîne de valeur, depuis l'importation, le stockage, l'emplissage, la fabrication de bouteilles et bien entendu la distribution chez le consommateur. Aujourd'hui, le Royaume du Maroc dispose de six terminaux à travers le Maroc, depuis le, sud, depuis le nord jusqu'au sud. Ensuite, nous avons 37 centres emplisseurs dans différentes villes. On peut remplir notre bouteille dans un un diamètre de un rayon à peu près de 50-60 km. Le nombre de bouteilles circulant, comme vous l'avez dit, 38 millions, un peu plus que la population marocaine qui est de 35 millions. La capacité de stockage est de 302 000 tonnes, assurant une autonomie des 44 jours. On espère arriver plus en investissant dans le stockage, mais 44 jours, c'est déjà un, un bon score. En l'espace de 25 ans, la consommation du gaz a triplé. Elle est passée de 21 kg par habitant à 70 kg par habitant. Donc, au fil des années, le budget annuel lié à la subvention n'a cessé d'augmenter. C'est un petit peu le revers de la médaille pour l'expérience le, marocaine. En 2011, la charge de compensation a atteint un niveau très, très important de l'ordre de, de 2 milliards de dollars par an. C'est à cause, bien sûr, de la flambée des prix du pétrole. Donc, dans ce contexte, le gouvernement marocain a entamé une réflexion autour de la décompensation du gaz en 2015. Cette réflexion s'oriente vers la mise en, en œuvre d'une décompensation progressive. C'est un petit peu ce qu'ont ce qu vécu les autres pays, comme le Brésil, le Mexique et d'autres pays. Donc, euh, la première partie de cette démarche est entrée en vigueur le 1er juin 2016. Elle consiste à la libéralisation des importations. Aujourd'hui, nous importons au prix du marché et bien sûr, il faut être compétitif pour pouvoir avoir le prix déterminé par l'État qui, lui, est subventionné par la suite. Donc cette étape n'a pas eu d'effet sur le consommateur. Le prix de vente n'a pas bougé. La deuxième partie lancée en 2017, cette année, consiste dans la réalisation d'une étude sur le système de décompensation visant à déterminer le ciblage. Donc, bien sûr, c'est comme dans les autres pays, il faut cibler la population qui a besoin de cette, de cette aide pour pouvoir utiliser la bouteille de gaz. Le secteur des produits pétroliers et la filière des GPL en particulier occupe une place importante dans le programme du gouvernement. D'ailleurs, M. Havedi en a parlé assez longuement. Donc, pour les cinq prochaines années, je pense qu'il y aurait des changements dans ce secteur bien sûr, tout en préservant cette consommation importante. Donc je laisserai le, le soin à monsieur le ministre demain, il va en parler lors de l'ouverture de la conférence. Une fois que le processus de décompensation par ciblage aura atteint sa maturité, c'est-à-dire qu'on aura ciblé toute la population qui a besoin de cette subvention, on pourrait passer à un système de régulation des prix pour pouvoir maîtriser, monitorer disait le, le, le prix du, de la bouteille. Donc voici un petit, en quelques mots l'expérience marocaine euh, qui, a, qui a duré depuis à peu près 30 ans ou 40 ans. Donc je vous remercie de votre attention et s'il y a des questions, je pourrai répondre sans aucun problème. Merci. Thank you very much, Mr. Idrissi. Uh, and there will be a, a questions after the group discussion from the audience and from panelists to one another. Uh, Ms. Maniara, would you please give your remarks? Thanks, Alex, and um, very happy to be here to share um, our current um,
plan for development of LPG. So in Kenya, LPG has had always been a very important um, fuel, household fuel, but it's not until around 2004 um, that it caught the government's attention in terms of being included in the policy then. Um, however, its inclusion in the policy was not very um, clear and it was uh, shrouded around the issues of environmental protection and around the issue of um, uh, reducing uh, reliance on charcoal fuel, but there was no very clear policy on how do you then use LPG as the alternative to those two uh, traditional fuels. Fast forward to 2015, the government did um, approve a very uh, broad holistic policy that has very clear uh, direction on LPG development. And the aim and the clear objective in that policy is to shift 100% uh, charcoal and firewood users and kerosene users uh, to LPG by 2030. Very, very ambitious uh, goal. Uh, from that policy, um, a roadmap uh, was developed, uh, and you can call it an LPG development plan or an LPG uh, master plan, was developed uh, last year in consultation with the LPG players, um, regulatory agencies, and the government. And the purpose of the development plan or the master plan was to ensure that then the government's policy aspirations were brought to life within the timelines that are stipulated in the policy. So the LPG policy, or rather the LPG development plan entails three key goals. Uh, A, to move um, Kenya LPG usage from the current 2 kg per capita per year to 15 kg per capita per year by 2030 or earlier, all things constant. Then the second key goal is to get rid of uh, kerosene within 36 months, starting from May last year, May 2016. The third um, key goal is to make LPG the primary cooking fuel for Kenyan households by 2030 or earlier. So the key objectives, uh, which are supposed to then, of course, ensure that the goals are met within the timelines, are firstly to increase uh, the storage facilities in our, import, in our port of import, which is in Mombasa, from the current 3 kT to 20 kT uh, by 2020, and then to 50 kT by um, 2030. The second um, objective is to um, increase the imports from the current uh, average of about uh, 140 kT uh, to about 1,000 kT per year. Um, and then to have a, a cylinder population from the current 3 million or 2.5, but we say 3 million for purposes of this meeting, to 18 million cylinders um, by 2020. So, and we have various uh, solutions and means that we will use to achieving these three key goals, which of course include uh, uh, regulatory reforms, which have already started being undertaken, regulatory reforms to ensure that there's an enabling environment that will encourage those who are already in the LPG business segment to stay and increase and diversify their investments, but also those who are interested in uh, investing where the potential is, and Kenya is one of the countries where there's great potential for LPG development, can come and invest in the shortest time possible. Uh, and of course, to ensure that there is um, a change in the current distribution and retail model, because that has been one of the impediments to the um, uh, development uh, of LPG in the last seven years or so. Um, the other um, means that uh, are within the LPG development plan, uh, the capital investment and strategic actions that uh, will be taken to ensure that the goals and the objectives that I've mentioned are met within the timelines. And this include, and I've already alluded to it, the construction of an LPG import and storage facility, which will enable us to then move from the current uh, storage capacity to uh, bigger uh, storage capacity to ensure that the unit price of LPG is reduced and also further to ensure that we benefit from the economies of scale uh, in country and also to facilitate exports where uh, required. 
Um, the other item uh, or solution with respect to capital investments and strategic uh, actions include, and I've mentioned, the increase in the number of cylinder population, and we are saying this should be tied to the licensing cycle so that each marketer has at least a minimum of 250,000 cylinders so that then we can build towards the 18 million um, cylinders target uh, in the medium term. Broadly, the other uh, solution um, that's within um, the, the, the which is a detail of the master plan is uh, supply chain optimization. Again, this has to do with ensuring that um, uh, there's a common user um, inland uh, storage and uh, cylinder refilling plant in each of the key consuming um, counties or cities, if you like. Um, again, to ensure that there's a optimal utilization so that as an LPG distributor or retailer, you don't necessarily have to put up uh, storage and filling plants. You can actually uh, feed off a common user or open access facility to ensure that then uh, there is quick penetration of LPG in terms of, uh, um, you know, uh, investors who actually want to just invest in one uh, part of the value chain and especially in terms of the LPG distribution and retailing. Uh, along with that, um, which is alluded to in the common user facilities to, to have a very strong and structured distribution networks and so on and so forth. Uh, and also to carry a sustained uh, um, consumer education and sensitization uh, uh, activities to ensure that consumers are able to convert and to uh, appreciate and understand uh, why they should use and uh, buy, um, you know, uh, safe cylinders and who are the brand owners, what does the law say, and so on and so forth, so that we can decrease the number of uh, incidences which then uh, inhibit uh, continued use of LPG and also create a lot of fear for those who are not uh, yet converted. Uh, then, of course, there's the effective uh, transport logistics, uh, which includes, um, um, you know, uh, using other safe modes of uh, transportation, for example, the rail. Um, so, in summary, those are the, the solutions that are in the master plan, but we also have just to add um, economic incentives to uh, support the growth of LPG, and some of those include um, uh, reduction of taxes, uh, LPG is currently zero rated, so removal of taxes on the um, uh, cylinder and the, and, the, and the accessories, again, just to increase the opportunities for access and to reduce the cost of conversion for those who are not yet using LPG. Currently, in fact, uh, we have um, a project, it's called the Monanchi Gas Project, which is as a result of uh, what we can call tax subsidization, where the government increased the tax on a kerosene, which is um, uh, what we can call not a clean cooking fuel, and which it intends to uh, eliminate within 36 months, and then decreased or zero-rated LPG. So the earnings that have been made from taxing kerosene are being used to increase or to subsidize LPG cylinders, um, and this will be deployed uh, for um, 36 months uh, by the National Oil Company of Kenya. So there's a lot in terms of the detail of uh, what we're calling the LPG development plan, but in a nutshell, that's what it looks like, and I'd be happy to make any clarifications uh, during the question and answer time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, thank you. Uh, Mr. Misumba, your remarks, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, permit me first of all to thank uh, Global LPG Partnership for giving me this opportunity to come and present the situation of Cameroon. I'm going to talk in French, my small presentation in French, but I'll be ready to take questions even in English. Au Cameroon, tout, on peut dire tout commence en novembre 2000 quand le gouvernement décide d'ouvrir le secteur pétrolier aval, y compris en ce qui concerne le GPL. Et cette ouverture a permis donc aux nationaux de commencer à investir dans ce secteur. Ce qui a permis de passer dans une situation 
du quasi monopole de quatre multinationales en 2000 et pour arriver aujourd'hui à 13 opérateurs qui sont dans le secteur du GPL au Cameroun. À ce jour, le taux d'accès est situé autour de 20% en zone urbaine et environ 7% en zone rurale. L'objectif fixé par le gouvernement étant prescrit dans sa stratégie pour la croissance et l'emploi, qui est d'environ de 60% en zone urbaine et 30% en zone rurale à l'horizon 2035. Au Cameroun, comment le marché est approvisionné euh, notre, Nous avons une petite raffinerie qui produit par beaucoup de GPL, environ 20 000 tonnes par, par an, ce qui fait que le marché est approvisionné à environ 20 et le reste, c'est des importations. Bon, le marché, l'évolution du marché de 2008 à 2016 16 est passée d'environ 69 000 tonnes par an à 95 000 tonnes en 2016. Cette évolution est satisfaisante pour le gouvernement, mais nous voudrons faire mieux. Une évolution depuis 2000, quand le marché est ouvert, à 2016, globalement, on sent un bond d'environ 40% d'évolution, ce qui est assez satisfaisant. Maintenant, la distribution. Comme j'ai dit tantôt, aujourd'hui, le marché est occupé par 13 marketeurs, et parmi lesquels, c'est une société nationale, la SETM, qui reste majeure avec environ 35 de part de marché. Les centres remplisseurs. À ce jour, au Cameroun, nous disposons de 16 centres remplisseurs répartis entre les différents opérateurs mais le plus, la plus grande capacité est détenue par la société d'État, la SEDP, la Société Camerounaise de dépôts pétroliers, qui dispose aujourd'hui d'une capacité de stockage de 3 765 000, euh, tonnes, pour une capacité globale aujourd'hui qui est située autour de 7 082 tonnes. Il y a une forte concentration des centres remplisseurs dans les, grands, les deux grandes villes qui restent les deux grands pôles de consommation, la capitale économique Douala et la capitale euh, politique Yaoundé. Mais l'objectif du gouvernement étant d'avoir au moins un centre remplisseur dans chaque chef lieu de région. Aujourd'hui, nous avons encore deux régions qui n'ont pas de centre remplisseur, la région du Nord et la région du Sud. Mais d'ici trois ans, l'État, à travers la Caisse de stabilisation des prix des hydrocarbures, euh, projette construire ces deux centres remplisseurs dans ces deux localités. Le parc des bouteilles. Le pack de bouteilles aujourd'hui au Cameroun, globalement, est estimé à environ 2 millions bouteilles. Et comme M. Evans a dit tout à l'heure, avec une population d'environ 25 millions, vous pouvez imaginer que c'est environ une bouteille pour 10 personnes. Mais l'État a pris des mesures 
pour pouvoir inciter l'augmentation de ce pack de bouteilles. Et depuis le mois de mai 2017, l'État a décidé de baisser les droits de douane de 20% à 10%, avec une exonération totale de la TVA sur les importations de bouteilles à gaz. L'objectif étant d'atteindre l'entrée sur le marché d'environ 400 000 bouteilles par an. Je voudrais, permettez-moi de parler avec euh, la coopération avec euh, Global LPG Partnership. Le gouvernement, en, 2000, en décembre 2014, avait signé un protocole d'accord après quelques discussions avec les dirigeants de Global LPG Partnership. Et ce protocole d'accord vise à aider le gouvernement du Cameroun à étendre la consommation du gaz, étant reconnu comme une énergie propre et avec l'objectif de protéger l'environnement et améliorer la santé des ménagères. À ce jour, avec Global LPG Partnership, nous avons mis en place le plan directeur de développement du secteur du GPL au Cameroun, avec des grandes recommandations qui commencent par l'augmentation des packs de bouteilles, l'augmentation des capacités de stockage, la revue de certaines réglementations, notamment la structure des prix, et avec le commencement, le programme d'augmentation de packs de bouteilles. À ce jour, nous sommes en train de travailler avec les experts de Global LPG Partnership pour structurer le financement de l'importation ou bien l'acquisition de nouvelles bouteilles. L'objectif étant d'atteindre 6,5 millions de bouteilles d'ici 15 ans. Aussi, avec Global LPG Partnership, Ayant constaté que les ménages pauvres, même avec de bonnes intentions, ne pouvaient toujours pas avoir accès au gaz, faute de moyens pour acquérir les équipements de base, notamment la plaque à gaz et la bouteille avec ses accessoires. Donc nous avons eu une idée de microcrédits aux ménages pauvres pour les aider à acquérir la plaque à gaz, la bouteille pleine avec ses accessoires. Et pour un coût global de 50 000 francs, remboursable dans six mois, nous avons commencé un projet pilote dans une localité située dans la région du sud-ouest avec 150 ménages. Au bout de six mois, les résultats sont encourageants. Et je vous dis, aujourd'hui, nous avons beaucoup de ménages qui n'attendent que le deuxième tour de financement pour entrer dans l'utilisation du gaz. En ce qui concerne les perspectives, mesdames et messieurs, le Cameroun a l'intention d'augmenter la production locale de GPL à travers l'extension de la production de notre raffinerie, dont le projet d'extension et de modernisation est en cours. Ce projet, à terme, permettrait la production de la Sonara de passer d'environ 2500 tonnes par mois à environ 4000 tonnes. Également, nous avons entamé des projets de valorisation de nos ressources en gaz naturel 
avec un premier projet, Floating LNG, l'usine flottante de traitement de gaz naturel, qui sera installé à Kribi, dans la région du Sud, et avec un volet extraction du GPL. D'autres projets sont en cours et envisagés dans des grands bassins de Tindé, qui euh, euh, détiennent les plus grandes réserves de gaz naturel du Cameroun. L'objectif étant, d'ici euh, 10 ans, que Cameroun devienne net exportateur de GPL. Nous avons également l'intention de créer de nouveaux, nouveaux centres remplisseurs. Également, la poursuite de l'augmentation du pack de bouteilles et ensuite la promotion de la fabrication locale de bouteilles. Il y a également la poursuite de la palettisation des camions transportant les bouteilles et les dépôts de stockage. La poursuite de la mise en œuvre des recommandations issues du plan directeur du GPL du Cameroun. Également, poursuivre avec l'assistance de Global Airpig Partnership la facilitation des ménages pauvres dans l'accès au gaz. Également, nous allons poursuivre le renforcement de la sécurité dans le secteur du GPL. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Mr. Zufkar. Yeah. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Good afternoon, the Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a great honor for Pertamina to be here in the prestigious uh, LPG Four Development Summit as part of World LPG Forum in the Morocco in order to share our experiences in managing LPG industry in Indonesia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me to know you about uh, Indonesia itself. Indonesia is one of the largest archipelago countries in the world. Within uh, 14, more than 14 islands from the India Ocean until to the Pacific Ocean. What it does mean? It was a great challenge for all of the company in Indonesia, especially for the LPG company in Indonesia to distribute the LPG efficiently and also effectively in order to reach all our customers. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, since 2007, uh, Pratamina has an assignment from our government in order to distribute it, the LPG instead of kerosene in order to switch the usage kerosene to LPG over uh, 57 million people until now. At the other end, the consumption of the consumption on kerosene has dropped from 9.9 .9 kiloliters in uh, 2007 and now only uh, 600 kiloliters. I'm sorry, 600,000 kiloliters. But on the other side, the LPG consumption increased significantly from 1 million tons in 2007 and now in 7 million tons. Yes, as, as a consequence of the increasing of the market of LPG in Indonesia, we need to develop our infrastructure. And 
The question is, what is the key of success of kerosene to LPG conversion project? The key success factor is about communication. How we communicate and socialize the program itself, the first one is how the people know what is the advantages that they may get. They should try by themselves to operate the stoves and whole LPG equipment. So it's a really simple. We launched what we call by the activation program to let the people who use with the kerosene stove try to use LPG instead of kerosene. And they can see what is the really advantages of LPG itself. After using it, they realize by themselves that LPG is more efficient and of course it's cleaner. As impact of the massive energy program kerosene to LPG gas conversion, we just now convert more than uh, five 57 million households within uh, eight years since 2007 until 2015. Uh, the growth rate of the LPG consumption are reaching up to 8.8% per annum. This is how to we accelerate the LPG infrastructure. Yeah, include in this how to develop our infrastructure of transportation, both in the sea and also in the land. Now we use what we call by very large gas carrier of LGC as a floating storage. As I mentioned before, Indonesia is really more islands. So we need a floating storage in order to reach the certain island. With the planning of the LPG conversion project to the eastern part of Indonesia, which, which starts in uh, 2017, which includes the conversion of fishing boats, uh, the usage of gasoline is converted into LPG. But it's only uh, limited to the fishing boats up to five gross tons or the horsepower until uh, 14 horsepower. We need to build more inland receiving terminals and storage facilities equally across the region so that we distribution, I'm sorry, so that the distribution would not be an issue. Hopefully, yes. We will build LPG refrigerated terminal in West and East Java, build LPG pressurized terminal in Sumatra, Java, and Eastern part of Indonesia. As you know, Indonesia has uh, 34 provinces. We are utilizing LPG storage also in the LNG on Bontang and Arun. And with the government, we are planning to build storage facilities in the eastern part of Indonesia. Through these services, we hope that Pertamina can secure all the supply of LPG throughout Indonesia. Pertamina has given a new alternative energy site from kerosene or gasoline and hoping 
that at the end all of the people of Indonesia may have the chance, I'm sorry, may have the chance to use LPG as cleaner, more friendly, and of course, healthier energy alternatives. Along the way, government of Indonesia has made another initiative by converting fishing boats from using gasoline to LPG. In 2016, we have converted about 5,473 engine boats. And now, in 2017, we propose by assignment of our government to convert more than 16,000 engine boats in Indonesia. And the project still running until now. As the most used of LPG are three kg cylinder. This is a subsidy product. And in terms of giving alternative product to the consumer, Pertamina launched the non-subsidized LPG by brand name is Bright Gas in 5.5 kg cylinders. It was launched in 2015 throughout Indonesia and we have received positive response from the consumers. The government also really support for non-subsidized LPG product. This is one effort from Pertamina to minimize the subsidy in Indonesia so that the consumer of 3kg can switch to the non-subsidized products and part of reducing subsidy campaign, we printed a noisy statement that only for the poor and the LPG cylinder body, so that the rights of the poor shall not be taken by those who are not entitled for the subsidy. Okay, well, that was the concludes of my remark, and I'm open for any question. Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much. There were a, a number of themes as I was listening to the remarks. In each case, the country has taken a, hol a holistic approach to dealing with its LPG development, looking across the supply chain, across the value chain, and coordinating all the different elements. Uh, there has also been uh, an emphasis on communications with the public, with the stakeholders, uh, with the consumer or future consumer. and. There has also been a, a, a smart effort to avoid shortages because shortages ruin all plans that are, are made. Um, I'd like to now drill down a little bit into some of these, uh, these questions. One of the things that was also common, and we all know who are in LPG, is that the role of the government is very important in nurturing LPG and assuring that uh, the market will develop in a sustainable way. But across the countries, there are different ways in which the state takes a role. It can have a fiscal role, it can have a taxation and duties role, it can own state enterprises which support or compete with the private sector in different areas. So I'd like to start with this question. Uh, let me start first with Mr. Idrisi about this. Tell us a little bit about the Moroccan industry structure and the role of the state in bringing about the system you have today. Merci Alex. Donc je disais tout à l'heure que pour pouvoir développer le gaz au Maroc, il faut la contribution de l'État pour permettre de donner des lois ou des incitations, même pas des incitations, pour l'investissement c'est juste ne pas qu'il y ait des droits de douane bien sûr, faciliter un petit peu l'investissement le, le, en tant que tel et le privé qui a les capitaux pour pouvoir faire des investissements conséquents par rapport au développement du GPL. Aujourd'hui, c'est vrai que au début des années 80, il y avait peut-être 3 4 centres remplisseurs, aujourd'hui, on a 38. Donc, c'est une 
disons, suite logique par rapport à l'augmentation la, de la consommation. Bien sûr, avec ça, il faut une distribution qui soit très efficace. Pour pouvoir arriver à un taux de pénétration de 99%, il faut qu'il y ait euh, un maillage de tout le territoire. Et ça, c'est grâce, bien sûr, au privé, grâce à, je dirais, euh, une implantation de, de, de dépositaires ou de mandataires qui vont dans tous les coins euh, du royaume. Donc tout ça, c'est de l'investissement. Bien sûr, à côté de cela, il faut une rentabilité. La rentabilité, elle est là. Bon, elle peut être mieux, mais disons qu'avec ce que nous avons aujourd'hui, nous arrivons donc à développer le, le gaz. Donc moi, je pense que ça va de pair. Le privé avec le public. Le public, c'est donner des incitations. Par exemple, il est inadmissible d'avoir des droits de douane sur des bouteilles de gaz. Si on veut développer le, le gaz, soit on les fabrique, donc euh, on a une fabrication locale, soit il faut les importer. Et ensuite, bien sûr, par rapport euh, à la population, faire donner des aides ou euh, donner des bouteilles, pas au prix d'achat. Le prix d'achat d'une bouteille aujourd'hui, c'est 30 dollars. Aujourd'hui, au Maroc, nous donnons la bouteille à peu près à, à 7, à, entre 7 et 10 dollars. Donc ça permet de consommer. Et c'est pour ça que nous avons cette augmentation. Maintenant, c'est vrai qu'il y a euh, la, le, la problématique de la caisse de compensation. Et c'est là où il faut faire un ciblage. Parce qu'à un moment donné, quand on arrive à des consommations, comme je disais tout à l'heure, c'est que tout le monde profite. C'est-à-dire le monsieur qui touche euh, 1000, 1000 dollars ou 500 dollars, il bénéficie de, 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 du prix de la bouteille. Voilà un petit peu. Thank you very much. Let's come back to that question on targeting to expand use of LPG to the right populations a bit later. Uh, Ms. Manyara, Kenya has, uh, has developed an active state sector now in, in LPG. Uh, when I first came to Kenya many years ago, it was a little less active than it is planning to be. Um, and the uh, industry and the government together had to, over the last few years, figure out how to tame unruly elements in the market which were undermining the investment climate uh, for new cylinders and projects and were creating a, a, a bad safety environment or a risky safety environment. I think Kenya has made tremendous strides. Can you just highlight for us some of the key ways that government together with industry worked to tame the, the Kenyan wild lion and harness a chariot to it? Thanks, Alex. That's a very broad question. And I'll try and answer it uh, very briefly. So firstly, um, the government recognizes that it's important to partner with private sector in order to meet the policy that they have crafted. Government, and particularly this particular government, I must say, um, recognized um, early in the cycle of change of policy that it was important to have private sector contribution in the policy document, because you can't go into a room alone as government, craft policy, and then give it to a private sector to implement. So the power of the industry association kicked in, and for the first time, uh, the Petroleum Institute of East Africa participated as a um, member of the technical committee that was crafting the government policy. So from that, there was a lot of uh, benefit that accrued from that participation. Because as I mentioned earlier, the policy that we had uh, pre-2015 was not very clear about what government needed to do. So we were able to hear what government wanted and we helped craft policies that were then able to provide solutions for conversion of charcoal, kerosene, and uh, firewood users to uh, LPG. The second thing is that uh, government understands that unless it's an enabling environment for investors to put in their money or to stay and support the policy aspirations, then they themselves are really not uh, the investors. It is the investors who know what kind of environment is needed for them to then promise to complement or to support government in the realization of this investment. And hence, um, again, the power of the industry association um, challenging and lobbying government to ensure that there is an environment that 
accommodates only the legitimate players and one that is uh, sane, one that is legal, one that is level, and one that is guided by uh, a legal and uh, regulatory framework that all must abide with. And private sector, uh, you know, again, extended um, an arm of collaboration with government, and government is only too happy to be um, not told what to do or guided in what to do, but to be, uh, what is that word? Um, to be advised, let me put to be advised, on what to do so that private sector is happy, but then again, teamwork. So um, in order to um, uh, read the segment of uh, the rogue traders, um, the private sector and the government both agreed that it was important to have a framework that had the um, consequences of non-compliance uh, increased and also enforced, which then meant, of course, the need to increase the capacity uh, in the regulatory agency that is responsible to ensure that there is a compliance enforcement and to also ensure that there is monitoring, uh, you know, throughout the, the business cycle. So again, uh, it's a spirit of collaboration, it's a spirit of a, we both believe in this objective, but we need to work together to ensure that the end game is met and that the government does need to ensure that the private sector operates in an environment that is uh, conducive to do business. And private sector also understands that it then needs to um, uh, meet their part of the bargain by continuing to invest for as long as uh, the government is uh, uh, showing goodwill in terms of ensuring that um, the enforcement is carried uh, without fear or favor and that the regulatory agency that is responsible has the capacity to actually carry out uh, their obligation. So it's partnership, partnership, partnership um, and collaboration by government, private sector, and especially through industry associations because then it is one voice that the government can listen to. It is a non-branded voice. It is one that is above commercial uh, issues but more to do with the, uh, you know, um, technical and uh, professional uh, approach to uh, growing a particular segment, LPG being one of them. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Misumbe, as, as our government representative on the panel, how are you and your colleagues in government thinking about the way to use government resources, scarce as they may sometimes be, to catalyze the sector's development? And what do you look to the private sector to do that government should not do or could not do? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the first thing to say is that in Cameroon, the LPG sector is totally in the private hands. Apart from uh, uh, the storage, where uh, the state still holds uh, majority shares in the uh, SADP. But the rest of the actors are all private investors. But the government comes in, first of all, to subsidize. Government subsidizes. Uh, uh, the, 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 the consumer and gov government, uh, as I mentioned earlier, tries to uh, incite investment as far as uh, uh, building storage capacities and uh, filling plants is concerned. And in this light, there is uh, uh, a specific agency uh, investment promotion agency that has been set up in Cameroon, and that is not only to promote investment in the LPG sector, but globally any uh, direct foreign investment. And uh, uh, in that uh, uh, law, there is a couple of measures that are made to attract investment, because for the sector to expand, you need investors. And the private sector is very, very happy with the earlier measures that I said that were taken in May by uh, reducing almost by 50% the uh, uh, custom duties on uh, importation of bottles. And then government denying itself totally the value added tax that is supposed to come with the importation of LPG cylinders. And uh, 
government is already also ready to enter into public partnership agreement with uh, uh, private investors, especially in the construction of a bigger uh, LPG reception terminal in the deep sea port in Kribi, uh, of which negotiations are going on, and also to improve on the existing terminal, which has a small capacity that is in uh, Douala. And that one, that terminal is, uh, is in the estuary and shallow water port. So uh, there is a couple of uh, 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 investments plus when you evaluate the uh, 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 measures that are meant to attract investment, you see that government is ready to sacrifice so that the sector expands because government has taken engagement in uh, 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 protecting the environment, fighting against divorce, deforestation and the desert encroachment, and then also to improve the livelihood of the households. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Musumbe. Mr. Zulfikar, let me take this opportunity to pivot uh, to a, a related question, and one which was touched on by Rachel Kite in her remarks before. Indonesia is sometimes viewed as having had this great success only because of the implementation leadership of Pertamina, which is essentially a monopoly in the oil sector, is a, a, the, such a substantial player that it could do what it wanted. But in fact, the uh, Indonesian program involved a huge number of other players that were coordinated with you. Uh, so you created a vast new distribution system for LPG to reach households and have retail density. You, there were more than 500, if I recall my statistics, 500 private sector players who became involved as partners, as financing sources, and so forth. So can you tell us a little bit about how uh, Indonesia and Pertamina brought in additional players into the ecosystem who benefited from your leadership and your investment, but made the entire project a bigger and faster project? Thank you, Alex. Uh, first of all, I, I want to share about uh, increasing market LPG in Indonesia is causing the uh, kerosene to LPG conversion. As you know, the, the key of the LPG conversion project is how we do what we call by, by brand activation program that I mentioned before. By this program, uh, Pertamina distribute free initial package to uh, 500 people in a small district in uh, Jakarta City for a month. And day by day, we evaluate uh, the usage itself and all of the problems that raised from uh, the usage of LPG instead of the kerosene. For the first week, only 16% uh, people will be used the LPG instead of kerosene. But by our treatment, by evaluation, and how to overcome the problem, at the end of the month, uh, they reach about uh, nine, uh, nine, six percent will be used LPG uh, freely not by emphasize for from our government. So it was really a good result for us to ensure our uh, government and also to accept the assignment from the government in order to do our kerosene to LPG project. And by this massive uh, program, as you know, we need to develop our infrastructure. We can do it by ourselves, so we invite all of the entrepreneurs 
both from the domestic and also for the foreign, not only to be a distributors, what I mean distributors here, uh, dealers and sub-dealers, but also to develop uh, LPG storage tank. As you know that it was a really a hard financial for Pertamina to do it by itself. We ensure that the consumer is happy to using the LPG. So that was really a, a long relationship in between Pertamina and consumer. And in order to fulfill all of the infrastructure, we ensure all of our uh, partners in order to participate for the sector's business from the upstream until to the downstream of LPG business. The first key I want to share in here that Pertamina have a contract with our partner for the LPG tank storage is about uh, 10 years contracted and we gave what we called by the filling fee and transportation fee and for the dealers and sub-dealers mostly dealers and sub-dealers is conferred from the kerosene dealers to LPG dealers but as you know LPG dealers is more financial investment rather than the kerosene dealers. So we also invite our uh, domestic bank, our national bank, to get a credit to all of uh, the sub-dealers, of course, and also our dealers. And in this kind of variety of uh, how to emphasize all of our parties and also the market growing uh, significantly, it was really an interesting uh, for our uh, partner, of course. And until now, we has uh, more than 600 dealers uh, before the kerosene to LPG conversion project, we only have uh, 66 dealers, now up to uh, 600 dealers. And also we invite for the foreigners, especially to uh, facilitate the sea transportation. As you know, it's, it was really a uh, highest investment. We also get a contracted with them in a short time, in about uh, three uh, up to five uh, years, both of using as uh, sea transportation and also for uh, floating storage. Thank you. I'll have to stop you there. We're running a bit short on time now, they're telling me. Okay, thank so you. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to give us a chance to talk about uh, one final thing as a group, and then uh, if they let me ask uh, the audience to contribute one or two questions. And uh, the question we should not leave without raising is how to help the poor get access to LPG. Mr. Masumi has mentioned a little bit about this. Um, Morocco has subsidized and is wrestling with how to evolve its subsidies. Pertamina has given out free equipment uh, to address the poor. There are a number of interesting programs going on in Kenya uh, to, to make LPG more accessible and affordable. Um, one of which is the notion of pay-as-you-go technology, which has, has become very popular there. Um, at the risk of um, running a little long, give, think of one or two sentences from your respective countries about what you, what, what things look promising for extending the boundary of LPG beyond its commercial limits to being able to bring more of the population into LPG use on a sustainable basis? 
Um, Wanjiku, would you like to go first? Innovation, and you've already mentioned the, the pay as you go, which is uh, the pay go. Um, and this is a model that helps consumers to pay and use according to their wallet. That's two sentences. You get a bonus sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the other one is to ensure that there is, there are storage facilities and filling plants five minutes from a residential area because then it cuts transportation. It cuts um, the inconveniences of having to carry the cylinder for very long distances. Uh, it also enables LPG to be available along with other competing uh, sources of energy, which are not necessarily cheaper. It's just that they are available at the point of purchase. So I think that's very critical. And consumer education and sensitization is very, very critical because Consumers need, even what you're classifying as a poor, they, we all use some form of energy. Mm -hmm. If the poor use some form of energy, can the cost of that energy be made similar to the cleaner and modern alternative, i.e. LPG, and packaged accordingly? Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll live with six. Uh, Mr. Misumbe, any thoughts? Yes, I'll be short. First thing uh, in Cameroon is uh, uh, government put in place regulation, simplified regulation on uh, uh, creating a sales point. Today, you have an explosion of sales points in Cameroon because the regulation has been simplified, but security is still maintained. Secondly, uh, like I said earlier, help finance the acquisition of the basic equipment for uh, cooking with gas. And that is ongoing. I think it is promising. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zulfikar, would you like to make any comment? Thank you, Alex. Uh, first sentence I, was, I want to share is about effective supply chain. As you know, Indonesia is the largest archipelago country. So, the supply chain is really uh, key issues to overcome this problem. So by uh, this commitment, uh, consumers can reach the LPG in the affordable price, not in low and high price, but in affordable price. And also the way to reach the LPG or to buy the LPG uh, in Indonesia, we also create uh, new kinds to buy an LPG by online, as you know. We have a contact center for all the consumers that want to buy uh, some kinds of LPG in our product. So they uh, can call to our contact uh, number. And then my dealer will be daily for as requested. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Idrissi. Oui, c'est bien. Donc, euh, par rapport au manque, donc la consommation, comme vous le savez, est très importante. Et donc, ce qu'on devrait faire et ce que devrait l'État euh, donner la possibilité aux privés de faire, c'est de d'innover, c'est-à-dire euh, des distributions directes avec euh, un call center, euh, des nouvelles bouteilles puisque ça évolue, donc donner une meilleure euh, utilisation du GPL dans les foyers marocains par de, de l'innovation, par euh, de nouvelles, euh, je dirais, de nouveaux matériaux qui peuvent euh, apporter une valeur ajoutée à, aux consommateurs marocains. Voilà. Thank you very much. They're telling me that we have to wrap up. So I hope the questions we have addressed are the same ones that were on your minds. And I'm sure uh, any of us would be happy to answer one-on-one -on -one questions later during the course of the forum. Let me just summarize some of the key things our panel has, uh, has talked about as lessons and wisdom for all of us. 
Uh, first, a clear policy and priority on LPG is essential as a starting point for developing large-scale LPG in a country. One must take a holistic view of its planning and its context with other energies. One needs well-defined regulations that are well, reforced, well enforced. Uh, a collaborative approach which can involve PPPs, uh, interactions with associations, and government is essential to success. There, needs to, there need to be vehicles for financing to be brought in, uh, particularly to expand the inventory of cylinders. But indeed, the entire supply chain must be addressed to ensure there aren't shortages and that there is efficient operation. The state can be involved more or less. It's not that important, perhaps. But uh, where it is involved tends to be in ensuring the basic infrastructure for the sector to be successful. Communications among parties and with the public is very important. Innovation helps a great deal. And to extend the reach of LPG, a variety of mechanisms, which I will summarize as consumer empowerment and support, can be uh, very effective. And as they get to a point of great maturity, then one hopes they can be refined and targeted with greater precision to help those who are truly in need. I thank my panelists for a very, very good uh, sharing of information and lessons. Now, the, uh, there will be a few moments when they switch the panel, and we will immediately move then to the LPG financing discussion. Thanks very much for your kind attention.